Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva. I'm here with my colleague Ben Roberts, uh, who is also hosting the, the summit. And we have today the privilege and, uh, of having John Yang with us. Welcome, John. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's really, you, it's really nice that you accepted to be with us this time. John is an amazing, an, an amazing person. I've, I've, I've been following a bit of his work, of your work, and, uh, and now that I get to know you, I got even more um, enthusiastic about your work. You've been working as a nature connection mentor, naturalist. You do something that I'm actually definitely going to be exploring, which is wildlife tracking. You've been working as a peacemaker, and you're an author, a workshop leader, a consultant. You've been searched by many people to do public speaking, and, and you have also gift of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And you've been working on this nature-based community building for over 30 years, and something really interesting, you've been researching into the impact and significance of nature on human intelligence and development. You've trained many people. You've been trained also by famous people uh, in the tracking fields, uh, including not so famous but amazing elders from um, indigenous backgrounds, indigenous leaders from different parts of the world, people from Kalahari Desert. It's really, really awesome uh, ways to figure out how uh, to be deeply in touch with the, with the land. And you've been authoring several seminal works on nature connection, including, I'm going just to name a few of them, um, How Birds Reveal the Secrets of the Natural World and The Coyote's Guide to Connecting to Nature. You've received a prize in 2016 as Champion of Environmental Education Award for your innovative work. And you've co-founded Eight Shields Institute and Whole Link Media. And you've been establishing an international network of consultants and trainers working to cultivate effective nature connection and mentoring programs in communities and organizations. Mm. Many, many wonderful uh, things to talk about. And perhaps, you know, better than to read from paper, what, do you, what, what is your life about is actually to really start by inviting you, John, to yeah, share a bit with us of how you how you enter this journey and and that kind of brings these different aspects of but i think with a strong emphasis on on our our deep connection with nature so could you tell us a bit like what in your journey led you to be where you are at today well i i really i think it thank you i'm i was wondering why i was feeling tired when you read that list of things that i've done i, I was like oh my goodness no i need a rest <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, um, I, my journey really honestly begins, um, with the wonderful influence of my grandmothers. I mean, they, they raised me close to nature. Um, you know, we had this extended family kind of household that my mom and dad worked. So the grandmas took care of my, my sister and I and cousins back and forth, you know, so, um, they really built this foundation in connection with nature with us children because uh, in those days it wasn't there wasn't much to do indoors you know so we spent a lot of time outdoors but they happened to be good at cultivating something and I would call that cultivation the heart of my work um, you know we go out and play as children and when we come back in it's what the culture does for us that either makes or breaks that connection makes it real or doesn't ground it you know um, there's all this research that speaks of interpersonal neurobiology, Dan Siegel and so on, but um, we all have longings. As children, we go and explore and play, and we want to come back and tell our story to somebody. And we're hoping that what we did was relevant. Maybe we brought berries and grandma makes a pie, right? Um, so my grandmother, one was from Poland and one was was from Ireland. So they, they both grew up you know, as farmer families and close to the land. So they were, they had a lot of innovative techniques as grandmas, you know, they were full of wonderful tricks to keep the kids engaged. 
And that built a foundation under me. And I, I noticed that the other children in my neighborhood in a suburban area of New Jersey outside of New York City, um, there was woods and fields and ponds and creeks around the neighborhood, you know, um, and the different children had different relationships or levels of relationship with that. And of course, I didn't know that at the time, you know, I'm looking back on that as a researcher and saying, you know, what was important about my childhood that led me to where I am now? And when I began to really do deep research into anthropology to understand why some people get really connected to nature and why some people don't, I began to realize the role that especially the grandmothers and the culture had to play when children were young that built a foundation. Um, but that I also worked with a lot of adults and realized if grandma didn't do that for them when they were children, there's still a, a checklist in the back of their consciousness that's waiting to be filled in, right? So it's never too late to restore your your root connection, you know, and our, our nervous system is longing for it quite literally. It's like a, a form of starvation in modern times in a lot of people, but it goes back very quickly because there's such a thirst in the in our beings for this root level connection that it, it will fill in quickly if it's if it's facilitated uh, in in a helpful way. Um, when I was ten years old, uh, I was totally hungry for nature connection. I didn't know it, you know. I just I just you know I'm looking at it now and saying that if you asked me at ten, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that. But that's clearly what was going on for me. All the other older children were going off into sports, and I was feeling like, wait. We're not finished with this nature thing yet. Like, come on, there's got to be one more thing. I can feel it. There's something else that's supposed to happen here. And um, that's when I met my mentor, Tom Brown Jr. in 1971. And he was quite literally looking for someone to pass on the mentoring legacy that he had received from his elder, who was an Apache elder that he calls grandfather. Um, and he was literally told by grandfather, you got to find someone to pass this down to. So you'll know him by the sign that he carries, you know? So when, when he met me, I happened to be standing on a street corner with a snapping turtle on a string. And he saw that as mother earth on a string. Um, and he asked me what I had caught. And I told him it was a common Eastern snapping turtle. And then he's like, aha. So he's got the cognitive thing going, but where is the heart connection? You know, does he understand the symbolism of the turtle as a representation of the mother earth? Um, so he kind of tested my passion, really. He started asking me a bunch of questions and came back to my house and went through my nature museum with me and then asked my dad if, if I could go to his nature museum. And, and I was, my mind was blown. The moment I walked into this guy's nature museum, I was like, holy, this is my neighbor. Oh my God, I'm going to spend all my time like a tick. I like to say like a tick stuck in his hide. And I'm going to just learn everything I can from him, which uh, was wonderful because he actually was looking for someone who had that passion. So he, you could say he initiated me then in the wildlife tracking and, and the ancestral arts, his survival and the basket making and the, you know, cordage and fire and shelter and edible wild plants. I mean, he basically raised me uh, with a lot of indigenous knowledge of my place, um, though I was the only child in the neighborhood who was being raised that way. But he had such a comfortable way of doing it. It didn't seem like, I, I kind of figured there must be a guy like this in every household that's doing that for every child. You know, So when I got to college, I had all this knowledge of bird language and tracking that my professors didn't have. And I thought that was strange because I, I held them up in high regard for their deep knowledge and understanding of nature. And I learned a lot from those two elders. Um, but they didn't believe me that I could you know, learn, uh, communicate with bird language uh, in the way that I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to know. Like I had no idea that everyone didn't know this. It was so obvious, you know? Um, so that was formative for me. And once my professors caught on to the fact that I really was doing that bird language and tracking, they actually asked me to teach during field ecology classes. They would turn it over to me for 20 minute segments here and there with the, with the other students. And I was really confused. Why doesn't, anybody know this? It seems like everybody should know this. I don't even know how I know it. Like I, I was not aware because Tom was such a clever mentor. He just asked, listen to my stories and asked me really cool questions, which may go out and look deeper, you know, and that was, that happens every day. You don't notice, right? So I started to think about this disparity between those who had the facilitation uh, of a healthy culture, drawing nature connection through the individual and those who didn't. And I thought, isn't there a way we could research and pull up these cultural elements that 
actually can make or break nature connection in a community and then somehow um, universalize them and incorporate them into modern programs, practices, organizations, families. And, and that's what I've been doing for 40 years now. Um, to great effect. Um, you know, the stuff works. You know, I didn't come up with it. I'm, I'm just researching it, and pulling it together. I like to think of myself as someone who carries a basket around the world and visits with different traditional cultures and kind of looks at what they're doing with their children. What are they doing with their teenagers? What are they doing with their young adults? How is that preparing them to move? And gathering those tools and putting them in a basket, bringing them back to the laboratory and studying them and finding out how is this accessible and really a reflection of the human nervous system and not a specific reflection of a cultural, a language or a particular oral tradition or a particular belief pattern, but it, it can uh, adapt, you know, and then I go to different communities. I say, here's my basket. These are really cool toys. Do you want to play? And people pull what they like out of the basket and then they apply it and they find that it works and they come back and they want me to bring my basket back again. You know, soon some communities I'm dumping the whole basket on the floor and we're picking through these tools. Um, you know, one, one for instance would be, you know, it occurred to me that these cultures that I really dove in with deeply are the ones that had this consistency that everybody in the whole village was raised to be super connected to the natural world. And not surprisingly, those are the people who come from very uh, challenging ecosystems like the Kalahari, as you mentioned, the Bushmen. Um, if you don't raise your children to be ultra aware and completely connected to lions and poisonous snakes and things They're like never that. They're going to survive. Yeah. Exactly. And then it's also a marginal landscape where you have to be able to see the subtlest, tiny little brown stick that you barely would even notice and know that, you know, two feet deep underneath the sand is this root that comes out that's this big that you can scrape and squeeze water into your mouth during the times of year when there's, you know, dryness, which is often in the Kalahari. Um, so they had to raise them with extreme awareness and connection. So I was super fascinated by the fact that, that the way their culture functions, they make sure everybody's connected. You know, everyone, no one is left out. And they're so egalitarian and they're so loving and open and accepting. I'm like, wow, there's lessons in this that apply to any and every family, any and every mm -hmm. community. Um, because I noticed that other indigenous groups, they would identify children who seem to have a specific acumen for nature connection. And they would raise them almost like a priestly class, you know, and then they'd have mm. all this pressure on them yeah, to regenerate the culture for everybody. Yeah, exactly. And I thought it was interesting that the San Bushmen were, no, everybody gets to be raised that way. And then that to me became a reflection because we're, they're one of the oldest cultures on the planet mm. and they are related to the ancestor of all human beings, you know, so we all, you know, we've all left Africa, left the Kalahari, went all over the world. Um, but these are our most ancient uh, ancestors reflecting back to us, our most ancient nervous system. Hmm. So that's that's been my research, you know, and, and there's been so many benefits that, uh, that come from that. Um, everybody needs it in the same way that we all need water and that we all need good food. We all need good nature connection. It's if we are literally like physically designed for that. And when we get it, it's very nurturing and very grounding and helps us to become more resilient, happy, empathetic, loving you know, all the things that I think are really important you know, uh, for, for times now. One of the threads that, that I think somehow connects with the, 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 that lineage of keeping, keeping the connection with nature, with your ecosystem alive, is something you touched about because obviously uh, Tom had, a, had a, a strong impact in your life, have the possibility to have him as a, as a mentor, particularly in the way he he came about in your life and I was think I was hearing and thinking damn man I didn't have that chance and I think there's a lot of so there's a lot of people these days that don't don't have that chance and I think that's particularly critical for men and 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 I was even thinking about another thing that it just came to me while I was hearing you is that actually these days in in the last couple of generations particularly mine and the new generations that are coming Somewhere between 18 years old and, and 30, 40 or more, you, you don't have children to take care of. So you're not responsible for, for children or have children around, many of us, nephews and stuff. And you don't have elders around. So you have this kind of stage of a lot of 
apparently freedom to do whatever you want, but not having those connections with the generation that is just coming and the generation that is, you know, on on on, on a way already kind of living, but has, has a, a mission in that space, also a lot of roles to do. And that I find that really interesting. And maybe it's a segue to what what is it in your research? What are the elements that you've identified for this cultural health let's say and perhaps we could also explore then what it means for personal on a personal level but i'm curious to see like what have you discovered in being in touch with this these different cultures and and making research on what can make a community can support a community in being grounded in their place and health healthy to deal with the the challenges of life mm. We are embarking on a, a project called the the Five Twelve Project, which um, identifies. You know, if you look at you were you were talking about the intergenerational thing, right? Um, if you kind of average out stages of life to eight stages, you know, roughly ten years each, sort of thing, right? There's different elements for different stages. Right, it gets even more refined. Obviously, you do something different with infants than you do with toddlers, that you do with a preschooler, that you do with a young child, an older child. Right, so it's a little bit more refined at the youngest stages. Right, um, but once we kind of get into adulthood, you know, the stages widen, but there are still markers, as you were saying. You know, that intergenerational, you know, the elders before me and the young people below me that I'm that I'm helping. You know, because one day I'll be that elder. Right, if I'm lucky. Um, you know, so there's there's this, uh, you know, we call it succession, right? When we're thinking about organizations, succession planning, you know, I'm going to move out of this role into this next role and I have to make sure I replace myself in that role. Um, you know, life in the village is a succession journey, right? Um, our nervous system is set up for it. There's certain markers and expectations. So we kind of average them out into eight bands, you know, representing getting older and older. Okay. But there's ages and stages of life. Um, when we look at, um, in modern times without the initiation that I think you were referring to, you know, you know, that what Tom Brown did for me was he initiated me into a kind of, uh, depth of connection with my place, but also depth of connection with myself, you know, um, and that initiation is really critical, but in modern times, a lot of people don't get to experience that. So they could be stuck in kind of a you know, even a pre-adolescent or adolescent stage of life, but their body keeps getting older. So, you know, in the ideal cultural scene, you're, as you age, you also stage and they're sort of moving together, right? But in modern times, what happens is we stage and we kind of self-initiate and it kind of goes a little wonky, but we keep aging, you know, so we, we may stay in a developmental place um, in some parts of our psyches, uh, at, you know, kind of stuck. And that's the part that I was referring to earlier, that there's parts of us that are waiting. There's checklists waiting in our nervous system that are saying, please check these boxes because I'm waiting. So we basically looked at these eight stages and then we looked at kind of eight areas of interest, you know, like within traditional villages, there's, you know, the hunter, there's the medicine woman or the medicine man that's working with the plant medicine there's the basket makers there's the shelter builders there's the tool makers you know so there's you might we might call them demographics now right areas of interest yeah um so we we again we put them into eight categories and then and then we looked at the different pathways of learning and experiencing and we we found eight pathways and we deliberately based it on eight because um there's these eight uh archetypal responses inside of us that you know one of them responds to sunrise you know we've all for a million years humanity has experienced sunrise it always comes from the east and it always has a very particular feeling and our nervous system actually recognizes sunrise as a feeling um and we can call sunrise the beginning right the beginning of the day and if you can Feel what sunrise feels like in yourself, and the, you know how it's pregnant with possibility. You go out in that early morning, the sky is so blue, and the birds are moving and singing, and there's this feeling anything is possible. You know when you when you go out into sunrise and you just allow yourself to connect to it. So 
when you're welcoming someone into a new experience, you can emulate the sunrise feeling by looking at the cultural elements that are related to the beginning. And these would be things that are for the beginning of a life. These are the things that you do with young children, which is, is the sunrise of life. Um, you can do it with your welcoming guests into your workshop. So this is the sunrise for the people walking into your workshop space. So we use archetypal modeling, you know, based on the eight times of day. And we started with just four, but then we found out that there was too many things in the four categories. So we, we went from, you know, uh, sunrise, noon, sunset, midnight, to sunrise, 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., sunset. And we've discovered these eight different energetics. And we organized everything according to that. And this was the wisdom of a particular elder who's passed on in 2005. His name was Ingwe. And he'd been raised by the Bushmen in the Akamba in Africa. He was of British ancestry, but grew up in Africa. Um, he was born in 1914. And he was on a similar quest to mine. You know, he, because his parents were some of the first settlers in Kenya, he had nobody else to play with but the Akamba children. So he was adopted by them and raised in that village and part of that family. But when he went into adulthood and entered the modern world, he realized that there was a lot of things that the Akamba had nourished him with that modern people were missing. So he found ways to generalize them and help people with these things. So he joined me in 1983 and we started the first project together. Now I had organized everything according to Roman numerals, you know, uh, you know, Roman numeral one, letter A, B, C, D, you know, and I had like 15 categories of things that I had found that were elements that all of these traditional cultures had in common that were missing in modern times, right? And he looked at me and he said, you can't use those Roman numerals, he said, because the Romans are the ones who got us into the problem in the first place, John, you know, and he said, we must organize using the, the directions, you know, we should use sunrise and sunset and midday and midnight and spring and summer and winter and fall this is the way we should organize everything you know so we we then basically went around to children in new jersey and ben you can appreciate this we went into classrooms and we just said to children what does sunrise feel like you know and they told us what it felt like and then we said what does it feel like at noon you know and what does it feel like at sundown you know and we just we got children to tell us the feelings of these times of day because we wanted to come from a really innocent place and because we were looking for something that transcended cultural specifics, you know, it wanted, we wanted to relate it to something very accessible. Um, and that was a lovely way to start. And once we organized my 15 categories into these eight categories instead, uh, then we graded them based on what stage of life they would be aimed at or who would wield them. This is a cultural element that only the elders would use. This is a cultural element that the teenagers use quite intuitively, you know, and then we, we put them on this eight by eight by eight spreadsheet, you know, and, and it's called 512 because that's eight times eight times eight. So what I've been doing is audio and video recording these 512 categories and 64 of them are done. And we, we prioritize these 64 social agreement uh, topics that can really enhance um, community functioning, you know, and also awaken the community to nature connection. And, um, yeah, that's 512project.com. You can have a look at that. It's, pretty, it's an interesting project. And I just did live audience presentations on 64 of these cultural elements. The sunrise of all of them is the greeting custom. You know, have you ever showed up in an event and nobody greeted you? Yeah. And then you never quite land. You never feel safe. And you don't therefore pay attention because you're feeling a little bit off the whole time, you know, so the people are presenting information and everyone's talking over each other and it never really comes together. And you kind of leave there being like, what was that? I don't know if I just spent my time productively or not. You might be looking no. at your watch. You no, know, I, I, I was just thinking like I had, I had uh, many events where people just get on that sense that of today of let's get on with business, you know, just let's get right. starting with things. And then, I had the occasion of being, for instance, in, in New Zealand with Maori and having a, an opening that takes a whole day. And yeah. you can see, like, the impatience of, of Westerners, like, well, let's get on with the business, you know. But All then right. you can – I've, I've kind of had – for me, it was a, a blessing to have the chance to go through those processes because I could really start – to get tuned into the importance of this entry point to establish the container or the the quality of the space yeah. that is going to that is going to unfold when you do it in such a way. 
that's exactly it. You know, and, and you're using the word container because we use that word a lot too. Um, you know, if we go back to the the sunrise feeling, right? We arrive and we park in the parking lot. We're in the sunrise of that event. And sunrise should be greeted properly. You know, the greeting custom is is the transition into the container, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and for us, you know, if we go through the motions of greeting people and welcoming them, but we're not truly present, then it doesn't feel authentic to them and they feel a little weird and we feel a little weird. So there's even like a role that we as individuals who are welcoming and greeting need to play, which is for us to land in our bodies and to be fully present, you know, to take a good deep breath, to listen with our senses, our ears and look out and appreciate the beauty of nature around us and the nature inside of our home and our lovely pet that's over there sleeping. And just remember we love our children and our families and to get that feeling in our body so that when people start to arrive into our workshop, we show up and greet them. You know, the power of presence as Dan Siegel talks about, you know, um, so much emphasis in people's minds today is like, well, my children are going to need this and this and this to succeed in the world. So I'm going to keep my kids moving on that. But he he emphasizes the needs for parents to actually just be present and to literally welcome their children and to be fully listening to them and engaging with them. He's pointing at the interpersonal neurobiology, the expectations of the nervous system that children will not feel safe, they will not connect, and they won't excel if they don't. Um, And that goes that holds you know. And I'm pointing at children because they're the east of the life journey. You know, they're the sunrise of the life journey. It's so deep in our nervous system. You know, so these cultural elements are really attentive to customs and practices that become agreement fields in traditional societies. Like, you know, as you said, the Maori, they they do this very long full day welcoming and greeting. And with the San Bushmen, if you go out with them in the morning, you'll meet them, you know, just after breakfast, we'll gather with them and go over and greet them in their place on the land. And they'll greet us for 45 minutes. Every single person needs to greet every single person, you know, so they take the time they hold your hand they talk to you in their language you have no idea what they're saying and you know we've been told they, they fully expect us to talk in our language to them while they're talking to us in their language while we're holding hands with each other and looking in each other's eyes and a lot of body language a lot of nodding you know and <laughs> one person after the next after the next and it takes 45 minutes and then we get down to business if you will whatever that might be we might go out and gather some uh, truffles from under the soil or we might be harvesting marumba beans or whatever we're doing. And then we'll build a fire and we'll all sit and we'll share the food together and talk story around the fire. And then it gets really hot and they want to go rest, siesta, you know, so they off they go and off we go back to our space and we kind of rest and wait for the heat of the day to pass. And now we're back with them in the afternoon. They greet us all over again as if we didn't do that same thing <laughs> in the morning and 45 minutes greeting them in the in at four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and it, it's, it's, you know, but that that's a that's an agreement field that that culture holds, right? But the thing that everybody who we bring from the Western world to visit this community, they notice that within a, a day or two of being with them, the nervous system of all the people that we brought from Australia, Europe, you know, the U.S., Canada, when we bring them to this place after two or three days of this beautiful greeting custom, people find themselves dropping in in a way that they just have don't even remember dropping in that deeply into themselves and feeling really safe and really loved and they get really emotional and all this stuff starts moving. Um, You know, because, uh, you know, in modern times, if the nervous system expects it, doesn't get it, and then stops believing that there's even a village possible or that love is even possible, you know, we begin to become cynical and it's all on the unconscious level, right? So that that's one example. The greeting custom is a wonderful example. Um, because it's it's one cultural element that can fit into a workshop. I mean, you can actually take 10 minutes and greet people. What's the big deal? Um, and, and it'll go so much better if you do. You know, and there's three components to a good greeting. There's three elements to a good greeting. You know, one is welcoming. Uh, another element is called wiping off the road dust. You know, you've traveled a long way. You got lost trying to find the place. You're showing up. You can see people show up like this. You know, their, their body language is like, ah. Oh, you know, they got this look about them, right? So, hey, you got some road dust. Let's hear your story. What's, oh, my God, the taxi ride was crazy. The, you know, oh, it was an Uber driver. I'm sorry. And he just was talking and he missed the turn. And now I'm late. And I was like, I can't believe this guy won't stop talking. And, you know, people need to tell their road dust stories. They need to release that. And if you let them do it, 
and you actually listen to them and ask them questions about it, they'll, you'll see them go from frenetic to present. And they'll be like, wow, thank you for listening, right? All of a sudden, you've got them even closer to arriving, right? And then the third part is always gratitude. We always share gratitude with each yeah. other. You know, hey, what, what are you feeling really grateful for today? Or what are you happy about today? You know, just let everybody share that, you know, in a circle and a round robin style. And everybody just goes, Whew. And you can literally feel in your body this shift yeah. into depth and, and presence and attentiveness. Um, and if you don't take 15, 20 minutes to do that, then you're fighting against the road dust frenetic thing. You're fighting against the I don't feel safe thing. You know, and then you go straight into the information and, you know, you, you might as well not bother because no one's going to remember it anyway. They're just going to wonder why they spent their day doing that. <laughs> you know what? One thing uh, I'm, I'm going to end That's over. That's just a of applied, but we call that applied cultural mentoring. <laughs> I, I'm going to end over to, to Ben. I think he has uh, something to, to, to share or to ask you. But what, I, what I'm feeling that's really interesting because I'm really into the conversation and I guess some of the people that might be listening to the, to the interview might be asking like, but this is a conflict, a conflict transformation summit, so where is, where is the conflict in it? And yeah, I'm feeling like there's a lot of things from what we already touched that, that are deeply meaningful to, to come to the space of looking a bit in our lenses to conflict. So just wanted to notice that. And Ben, you have something to to offer. Yeah, well, to pick up on that question, right? I mean, what I'm hearing is that if you are grounded in these ways, whether it's, you know, your your awareness and your connection to nature and place or, you know, a clear understanding of the stages of the day and the stages of life and these different roles that fit together, then conflict is a very different experience because it's happening inside of a container that can hold it. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so that's sort of how I see the, the direct connection. I also, there's a particular domain of conflict that started when, when you first were talking, John, about going, you know, with your basket, collecting all these indigenous, you know, traditions. I immediately had this, you know, red flags, the wrong word, but I had this curiosity around the challenge of cultural appropriation, right? Mm -hmm. This this cardinal sin of the the Western colonizer and and you know now the sort of woke liberal sort of trying to feel good by you know adopting things that that have caused deep pain and injury to people whose traditions they feel have been you know stolen and abused. And and clearly that is not where you come from. You've spent you know deep time with so I was sort of, but but I think there's a source of conflict, particularly, you know, in our activist realms, which is part of the context for this gathering, this question comes up. I had an experience in a, in a group I was facilitating where I invited us to use a talking stick and I was told, no, you know, you, you, that's not right. Um, find some other way to, to manage the process. And I was surprised and I, I, I thought that was, you know, it didn't create a lot of conflict, but I think there are. You know, this is one of the tension points around how we navigate this stuff. So that happened in early in the conversation. I'm going to tell this sort of a short little story that tracks a few things because it's just so interesting to me how stuff shows up in sequence. Um, so then um, you're, as I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about um, a contrast to that with the, um, the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. And this was way before you're now talking about greeting, but this is a greeting process, right? That the peoples of the Iroquois Confederacy will, will go through this process thanking every element of, of nature and humanity. And, and it can take quite a long time, maybe not quite 45 minutes. I haven't seen it you know, done in its traditional mode this long. And I learned about it while I was reading Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, where she tells this lovely story of engaging with Oren Lyons, the, um, the indigenous elder around this and actually approaching him and saying, is it okay if I use this? And, and Lyons' response is, are you kidding? We've been waiting 400 years for people to start <laughs> adopting this practice. Please take it and use it, right? So I'm reading this just as I'm getting ready to open uh, the Nawa Global Gathering, that, that's one of the things that I do. And, and we opened the, the October, November edition of it with this practice in, in two rounds. And it was just so delicious. So 
so here's the other thing that's so amusing, right? How weird the universe is. As as I'm thinking all this and listening to you, my phone rings and I look over at caller ID and it's Lions. <laughs> that wasn't Oren, but you know, <laughs> I'm just getting this message. I think I need to mention this and talk about it. And so, you know, and I just I just love what you're saying about the power of of greeting and the importance of that and those three stages. And, and I guess I just want to bring it back to what first came up in my mind in this, this sort of question uh, around, you know, how do we reclaim our, our roots and our groundedness in these practices in ways that, that, you know, that we can be comfortable are not going to fall into this trap of cultural appropriation? Um, do you have any suggestions, any wisdom, any learnings for people you know, and, and if you're in that kind of space, if that's a source of conflict, do you have any thoughts around how to navigate those kinds of dynamics or the broader question of, you know, this whole tension between the developed and colonial mindset and the indigenous one? We, we had an interview yesterday, you know, where money was the terrain of that conflict. Where, you know, why is it that the North has all the money and the South, you know, is, is, is having to beg for it? And, and um, so these, these, these tensions run through, I think, that you know, that's a, a microcosm of this larger set of tensions that we're grappling with and a source, of course, of enormous conflict. So with, with that, I'll, I'll just uh, <laughs> turn it back over to you. I'm just so enjoying listening to you. I feel like you embody so much of what you're naming, too. I, I just uh, I'm, I'm really love mm, this. Thank you, Ben. These are all really important questions. And as you said, you know, the, you know that, that innocent example of wanting a talking stick to get something started. Um, I I work with uh, David Vanderhoop, who's a Wampanoag elder from uh, Nompi, which is Martha's Vineyard, and he's addressing the the what he calls the mammoth in the room, not the elephant in the room. That everything that we do with eight shields is really, by definition, uh, a giant form of cultural appropriation. And at the same time, his family has um, benefited greatly from the practices that we've brought forward with the five twelve map. Because what we're doing essentially, and you know, it's not limited to indigenous people in North America. You know, we I've done deep research into Ireland and to Poland. I looked into all my ancestral roots in Europe, um, as well as the little thread of indigenous from North America roots that I have from Canada um, in my family line. And then also, uh, you know, looked all and on every continent where humans have been living for a long time to say, well, what is universal to all of this, right? Um, because as I said, you know, we're using the eight directions as an organizing principle, but we quite literally use the X, Y, Z axis to organize our material. Um, you know, the, the X North, South, East, West, and then the Z being the, the one that makes it three dimensional, which goes from ground to sky. So we quite literally use that as our basis for organization. Um, and then when we add it, the uh, North, West, South, East, you know, our Hawaiian friends in Anahola <clears throat> who were helping us solve this problem, how can we create a, a universal matrix that all cultures can communicate through, right? So they basically said, well, what's missing from your map is past, present, and future. Um, you know, thinking of ancestry, thinking of us in the current times, and then thinking of the future generations. But we collaborated a lot with the Tree of Peace Society between 1990 um, and 1999, where they helped us to integrate um, peacemaking concepts and that was uh, Jake Swamp and his wife, Judy. Jake's an ancestor now, but they're Akwesasne, uh, Kanyangahaga, Mohawk people from up there on the, on the borderlands. And Orn Lyons was involved some too. Um, because as you said, you know, they were, they were waiting for us to wake up to the things that are missing from the Western culture that would make us much better neighbors and much better partners in, in caring for the, the world, right? So one of the ways that we've um, worked with the, with the, you know, the cultural appropriation challenge is that one acknowledge that all of all human beings need a healthy culture and that some some lineages of humanity have lost a sense of what that means and without it you know they're impoverished so then looking at what does culture actually do um, as a function as opposed to an artifact you know because oftentimes when we talk about culture we speak of a specific language or specific practices within a you know lineage of people that come from a place right the safest thing is to not not to go into those realms you know because that's very specific to that lineage 
to that family, to that region. And we don't need to go there. I mean, that, you know, maybe the talking stick comes from a particular place. And that pain, you know, as David himself said, when he came to an art of mentoring and, and when people, uh, you know, white European descendants in Vermont were smudging him and his family, he was highly offended by that because his own grandfather got arrested for having, for practicing his ways in Martha's Vineyard. Um, and that just being aware that the pain of that history is real and that we need to be in an open dialogue with our traditional indigenous neighbors wherever we are on the planet to just know that those histories exist um, and to understand where the pain comes from. But then to be an open dialogue, as David would say, you know, let's look in each other's eyes and build a relationship as human beings and then let's figure out how to move forward because these reconnection practices are really, really important for all of humanity right now, especially in a time when so many people on the planet are so disconnected from nature, from themselves. So what can we do to restore connection? But let's keep, let's keep, the, let's keep it on the table here. Let's be really open and honest and be really respectful and, and listen to each other. Um, because what does the talking stick actually solve is a nervous system problem. You know, you were, you were having the instinct, Ben, what we need to do is all feel safe. We all need to be heard. We all need to be present with one another. Um, because if we aren't feeling that way, the interpersonal nervous system is not kicking in. We're not going to get anywhere. So we're going to already start with conflict because we didn't address another elephant in the room, which is that we're not showing up in a present and connected way. So what's the point of talking about conflict if we can't first connect, you know, um, I like to think of it, the, the priority on connection first, you know, I, I boil everything down to that, you know, connection first. Um, so that's the, that's the problem we're solving in applied cultural elements, but we don't have to use a talking stick or we don't have to use, you know, a particular specific thing that could cause harm or, or offense uh, from our indigenous friends and neighbors. So the question is, what problem are we solving by using a talking stick? And is there another way to solve that problem, which is what you addressed? You know, um, and we teach um, when we're working with, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear from my colleague, Deborah, who has been working with the peace building and relational modeling side of what we do as village builders. We call it the village builder pathway. Um, you know, we're constantly bringing people's awareness to the potential pain from cultural appropriation perception and to be really aware that when we're doing cultural restoration or cultural repair work, what we're really doing is, is trying to get the wiring back into the system, but that there's more than one way to do that. You know, it's there's a specific circuit that's been broken, but we don't have to use smudging or an eagle feather to fix that. You know, there's other ways to do it. So we try to give three, four examples from multiple parts of the world. Whenever we introduce something like this, we talk about the principle that it's addressing. We talk about the problem that it solves in modern times. And then we talk about modern hacks. You know, how's it being done in the hip hop community, for instance, where it's completely cool and totally fine for them to do it in that way. But then in kindergarten, this teacher came up with a really innovative, way to, innovative way to do that with young children uh, and uh, doing it in a very unique and creative way. So, um, just being highly aware that there's more than one way to solve a any particular problem when it comes to connection and that you can learn from the different ways of it being modeled, but then ultimately you have to be inventive and also really aware of who's in the room. You know, what is the, you know, in permaculture, you know, the zone, the zone one, right? What is right around me and looking at the other people in the room as information, we need to know who are you, where are you come from and coming from? What is your fears? What is your history? Um, what, are you, what, are you, what are you concerned about? And to get an inventory of all that before you actually apply any cultural element, because if you don't do your homework, then you'll end up in a situation like you bumped into there, Ben. And I've been there, you know, because I've innocently done the same, you know, having yeah. spent a lot of time with indigenous people um, and ha having spent nine years with the Tree of Peace Society working, we always started everything with the, the words before all else, the, the Thanksgiving greetings, which are just so beautiful to experience. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to do is they said, let's not talk about anything important until we remember that we're human beings and that we're part of an interconnected sphere of life. And if we have all of that in our minds and hearts, then we can actually have an important conversation because then we'll consider all the things that are needed. You know, So there's real reasons for that kind of greeting custom to be 
incorporated in modern times because so often uh, nature doesn't show up on the agenda at all. You know, it's barely in our hearts, let alone our minds. Um, so yeah, I hope that addressed what you were asking, Ben. But I, the, the, we have an advisory council of indigenous people working with Eight Shields, and we've created a trust to hold the intellectual property. And we have a fund in our foundation to, if there's any revenue, and there's never hardly any revenue, but if there is revenue, then it will flow into that fund um, to make sure that it can benefit indigenous projects as well. So um, we're trying to be very conscious of that, you know, because this is universal knowledge that seems to reflect all of humanity, but there have been specific consultants from many traditional cultures around the world that have contributed freely, mainly because we're doing a kind of globally crowdsourced, you know, how do we apply connection in modern times in a way that could really help heal lots of people um, and help, you know, help with, con we call it conflict prevention. Because if, if you, if you have connection first, then conflict is much easier to navigate later, you know, if, mm -hmm. and if you come into conflict without connection, it's can be really messy, you know, so I've found that the connection first approach has really helped with a lot of our, our peacemaking and, and problem you know, conflict resolutions work that we've been doing globally, so. Yeah, so there's a couple of things coming up for me. Um, one is this, that I, I worked a lot on, on intercultural learning, and I think one of the things that, that this conversation kind of really opens up for me is that we're always going to run into trouble. It's like there's no chance to, to no get in a place of saying, I get all the things sorted. I can enter into this space, and and I, everything. I'm going to be protected from everything, as long as we kind of are are really open to engage with the world in a, in a way being present. We're going to run into trouble. What I think Absolutely. is really important. You're saying, John, is that we need to be connecting with our intention. And I, I remember there's this question on non formal on non violent communication of do you want to be right or do you want to be connected? You know, like and, and that, mm. that is a very powerful question because if we want to be connected, if we want to be in a place of respect with other, we're always going to try to understand in what ways you your this field makes you feel bad so that I can I can then tune in and, and learn with that experience. So I've, what I figured out is if you go in that space of, of deep respect and opening up to understand, then you will always, the, the troubles you run into will, will start sort it themselves out. Yeah. And, and now you mention these things because you, you, we start to enter into a bit of the space of conflict. And I'm curious to see, like, from your work with nature and communities, what have you been discovering that could really help people in this work of, on one side, being themselves prepared to be in difficult situations, to be in that space that you can go and know that maybe I'm going to run into trouble, but I, I'm, I'm willing to do so and open to hold that. And we already give some hints with, you know, proper creation of the container to have those difficult conversations or to be in a place of connection and presence. I wonder what what other elements, what other things you've been figure you've been discovering that are relevant for individuals and groups to be able to meet conflict in a way that can uh, that can be generative and more healthy. Because I would say most of the spaces we are, uh, the ways we've been dealing with conflict are not healthy for us individually and collectively. So. Mm -hmm. This might feel like a disconnect, but please bear with me, everybody, on this one. Um, over the years, I've, I've had the opportunity to mentor people, you know, 5, 10, 15. You know, I have relationships that go back 40 years. And Tom Brown is still in my life, you know, so many years later here, 50 years later. You know, he, we're communicating every day. Um, so I've seen people go on journeys, you know, and I've, I've watched them you know, people that I've worked with from the nonviolent communication communities or different conflict resolution fields. Um, I don't only work with naturalists, right? They're, they're a rare breed. Um, but I, I've brought my work out into community building settings all over the place through our village building network. And um, I've gotten to watch people progress, you know, on their own developmental journeys. And I've heard a story again and again that I think really we should listen to very carefully. And that is that the people who first start to go out by themselves into nature and maybe to sit under that same pine tree every day um, 
and I encourage this, you know, we call it a core routine. We call it a sit spot, literally, you know, and it, you don't have to sit on the ground. You know, if, if that's, if that's a, a problem for you, just put a chair outside your door, quite literally, you know, I mean, literally just outside your door, put a chair and go and sit there. And, you know, in the morning, the mountain bluebird flew up and greeted us here and we were able to interact with this beautiful bird. And then off he went. And then he came back again a little later and he sang. And then the female tanager, she came in and we looked at her and I've been hearing her through my friend's phone calls when she's sitting there. I can hear that bird in the background, you know, and now I met it in person, you know, and I, I feel the relationships of my friend Sarah to this place where she lives and she sits every day multiple times outside just for a minute or two. Well, what happens when we do that? As we start to make relationships with the trees, that the dead elm that the birds like to sit on and sing from and this living elm that provides shade and nesting for the for the house finches. And we start to make, as the Bushmen would say, we start to have threads with these things around us and they become strings and then they become cords and then they become ropes. And we start to feel empathy with these beings around us, be them, be it a moth, uh, a Venus last night as the sun was setting, just looking at this beautiful planet, you know, shining through the, through the evening sky, the feeling of connectedness to the natural world. What does that do for me as a man, you know, or for Sarah as a woman? Um, we become a different version of ourselves. We are able to hold more space because we have more ropes to the natural world around us. So when people are on this journey, you know, in the beginning, they come at it from their heads, you know, oh, I like plants. I want to identify plants. I want to look at the leaf type and I want to look at how many, you know, petals are in each flower. And they learn these big technical terms. Um, or the birders, you know, oh, there's a new bird, check on my list, check on my list. You know, we start up here in, in mental framing, you know, however we approach nature. But when we start to spend time and we let those threads of connection form into relationships where we start to feel them as family, I become a different version of myself. Um, so I watch people go on this journey, you know, and they start out in their heads and they're very focused and kind of intense uh, about what they're learning and what they're proud of learning and all that. But if they spend enough time sitting in nature, they start to soften and they start to open. And then they start to notice things. When they walk into a room, for instance, in the past, they didn't really want to have deep conversations with strangers. But now that they've been spending so much time in sitting and letting their nervous system open and letting those ropes form, the way they feel in themselves, they start to become a walking version of nature. And when they walk into people that are not having that experience, they find people gravitating to them, instinctively drawn to them, and telling them their stories. You know, this one woman, Jen, she grew up very intellectual, is by, from a very intellectual family in the, in the East Bay, in the city, in Oakland. She said, I couldn't care less. I don't want, I don't know anything about people's personal lives. Like, keep that away from me. You know, like I have a cognitive journey that I'm on, she would say, you know, but she said the more time she spent at her sit spot, she'd come back into the, into the community house in Oakland and people would start coming up to her and just telling her like these super deep personal things. And Jen's like, whoa, this is really weird. Why? I don't, I didn't ask for you to tell me that. Well, you are such a good listener. I feel that you are listening deeper than anyone ever has listened to me. So I feel really safe and letting things out of myself. So, you know, Jen said in the beginning, she completely avoided human interaction because she didn't want those uncomfortable conversations, but being in nature increased her nervous system capacity to the point where some suddenly she was able to absorb and ground and hold space in a way that was really helpful to community conflict. And all of a sudden she was the peacemaker in her shared household. Um, whereas before she used to be part of the conflict team, you know, her, her insistence on things being a particular way and wanting certain controls, like all of that eased and she began to be much more open and absorptive, you know, so over the years I've seen hundreds of people go on this journey and all of them have become really beautiful peacemakers. I mean, you know, they, well, again, back to Orrin Lyons and Jake Swamp, <clears throat> Judy Swamp, the Haudenosaunee people, they say, the great law of peace came from nature itself, you know, and if we want to be true peacemakers, we have to remember that connection with the plants and the animals and the birds and the trees, because then we have the capacity as human beings to be fully present and fully able to hold and be empathetic and, you know, to have that connective field that contributes to the well-being of the group. And I think you know that certain people walk into a room and all of a sudden everything feels better. You know, it's not what's coming from here. It's the space that they're holding. It's a felt sense that we get from them. And nature connection can really give that to us. 
you know, we can increase the capacity of our community to hold by building relationships with the plants and animals and birds and trees and wind and sun and moon. That's just true. That's just what our nervous system is designed for. So when we nurture our nervous system, then we have more resilience and capacity. Um, we have more creativity. You know, we have more sensitivity. We're, we're more aware. We're paying attention on many levels. Um, and we get out of our heads. You know, as Brad Keeney says, you know, we go from the small room inside of our head, that box that we get ourselves in, and our room becomes much bigger. And then there's more room for others in that room. Yeah, I was thinking definitely it must be an experience you feel in, in people going through those processes that actually when you are fully present in that way to nature, nature also is not only the people that come to tell you the stories, also the place starts to tell you more stories and the nature starts to, totally. reveal, to reveal much more, right? That's, that's amazing. Yes, absolutely. We are, we are getting close to the, to the end of our time, but I mean, we, we didn't talk a bit about some of the things we wanted to talk in the beginning, like, yeah, so storytelling. So I wonder what, what we could still touch a bit before we close. For me, just, yeah, to, I could, add, I could. just, to, just to get a bit of a sense to people that, yeah, this practice of having a moment of the day for yourself, particularly in a place that is not just turned to the teen wards, but actually just observing what's around you at, the, at your door or under a tree sounds really a very wise and great um, uh, tip and has multiple effects on us. And, and then that can really help us ground. Those kind of practices on a sustained way can help us be grounded and have the nervous system in a place that can uh, be meet in a, from a better place the difficulties of, of conflicts and tensions that naturally occur in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, there's maybe other things you want to say, so let's let's try to, to to kind of close with the last things you feel really yeah. important to share, John. Yeah, I would wrap it up in in a very uh, you know roll it all up into these three concepts. Okay, one, the nervous system is hungry for certain kinds of inputs. So give your nervous system, awaken your senses. When you're sitting outside or even inside, use your ears, eyes, nose, skin, tactile sense, emotional sense. Try to use it all the time. Don't just get locked in your thoughts or just your visual sense. You know, Bring in your ears and your eyes at the same time. We call this awakening the senses. If we go outside and we have an experience and we awaken our senses, it's like undeveloped film. Maybe some of you remember that. You know, you take pictures and you take the film out. You might not even believe this is true, some of you younger people, but you actually take this thing out called the film canister and then you put it in the drawer, but you never see your pictures unless you send it off to be developed. Well, our nervous system has a version of that. If we go out and have an experience with the Western, the mountain bluebird, and, and then we don't go inside and tell my grandmother about it, then it doesn't get stored into long-term memory and the senses don't get integrated. So we can awaken the senses, but we need to integrate them, which is done through storytelling, sharing our story, by living our experience with as much sensory memory as possible. So the one, awaken the senses, two, integrate them through sharing stories with this, by reliving experiences with as many senses as possible. And then the third thing is to realize that we will not feel safe to tell our story, and therefore we won't integrate unless we have a good connective container. So it goes, you know, it ties everything that we just talked about today, right? We're, we're attentive to our own personal relationship through our nervous system, to the plants and animals and wind and sun and rain and insects that nurtures us. We deepen that nurturing by sharing those stories with others. But unless those others are welcoming and willing, in other words, as a container of welcoming, then you know, those three need each other is what I'm saying. It's a virtuous cycle. It's a whole systems approach, right? They don't exist without each other. Uh, that's how I would wrap it up. But we need to tell our stories. It's super important. That means we need to have people to catch our stories who actually listen and love and make us feel safe. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, hey, Nuno, would you be willing to catch my story? You know, yes, John, what does that mean? Well, let's, let's give thanks each other let's take a minute to wipe the road dust off and give thanks and, and be present with each other when we feel ready then i'll share my story with you it'll only take 10 minutes you know 
but to just remember to ask permission if you're going to want to share your story. So often we come in full of excitement to share a story and we just lay it on the first victim that we bump into <laughs> and they may not be able to catch our story, you know, and it's not their fault, you know. So just to remember to to invite it, you I, know. And it, in a way, it's a drama from our times. Like you cross people on the street and they ask you how you are, but they don't really want to know. They are busy <laughs> going to the next meeting. So that's something I found out in Africa really amazing, that people, if they ask you how you are, they, they are there willing to listen to your story. And it takes, no matter what time it takes, even if you have a meeting that is already, you're already 20 minutes late. <laughs> and, and I, I, that that really triggered my own understanding of time. Ben, you have you have something to share before we close, right? Yeah, it's kind of a, a short story again coming out of this conversation um, that I think connects with what you were just describing about the importance of of those grounding stories and that experience. But but this is kind of the reverse. Um, it was it was triggered first when you had that incredible metaphor of saying when you met Tom Brown and you were so entranced with him that you attached yourself to him like a tick <laughs> stuck in his hide. And, um, you know, I live in Connecticut where Lyme disease was discovered. <laughs> and um, just this morning, I pulled a, a very tiny, probably deer tick off of my wife's clavicle and wasn't we weren't even sure I got the whole thing out and we were worried about that. Um, and I think about what's happening now with COVID, right? And, you know, even before that, the the stories that children were being told by their grandparents, <laughs> you know, was nature is terrifying. It is dangerous. We need to protect it. We, there's all kinds of things in it we should be killing as best we can and getting rid of. They serve no function, um, they, you know, and and now with the virus, that's just happening in spades, right? So these stories, these these powerful stories of danger and disconnection you know, that are, that are seeping through things. And, you know, and yet here you are talking about a tick of all things as a model, <laughs> as something you want to emulate and learn from. So I, I just feel like there's something beautiful and transformational in that perspective. Uh, but I'm also just leaving with this, you know, being in touch with my, my sadness and my concern for how, what you are offering and what you, what you've learned and what you see is is so, um, you know, is so precious and unusual, and and feels scarce in 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 the, the dominant narratives that that we're surrounded by. It, it's it's not by chance. Yeah, go, John, please. I was just going to say thank you, Ben. Yeah, it was really wonderful to hear that reflected. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah and, and that was just it was just making me think, Ben, like. It's not by accident that 80% of, of what is kind of pristine forest and nature around the world is, is there because there was, there's people still alive these days doing this, this maintaining this, these stories that keep the threads going with, in relationship with the land. I do think, and just as a, as a word of, of, of uh, of hope in a time of hopelessness is that I think this, although we are hearing narratives of separation in the COVID, the, 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 the virus is an enemy, an alien being, I hear more and more people talking about it in a different place, from a place of maybe it's a messenger, is a good friend, is a dark angel that is is uh, is here to to help us in this moment to to transit, to go, to go through the pains of, of birthing another pos other possible way. So mm -hmm. I just want to, I want to leave us with that. And John, thank you. Thank you so much for this time it was wonderful. It made mm -hmm. me feel thank really you. longing for more conversations and sitting on the porch, looking at the nature together. So <laughs> I hope thanks. we get to do that someday. Yeah, I hope <laughs> to, I hope to. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for being here with, uh, with me. And thank you, John, for being with us. Mm -hmm.